Sailing La Vagabond, very popular YouTube channel. Well done, guys. I mean, you can really be proud of everything that you have done there. Wearing my glasses today, I'm getting a bit old. So take any information that I give you with a pinch of salt, right? Riley, we just like to thank you very much for inviting us to make a comment. Um, we think your video, by the way, is fantastic. I, I don't think that um, you could have done it any better if you tried. Uh, you've been very respectful in everything that you've said. And um, I really don't think you could have ruffled uh, any feathers there. Um, I think you've brought a great uh, dimension to sailing lightweight catamarans as, as being an option uh, when you go cruising. And, and you've asked us for our comment. Love, so would you like to maybe just say something about the choice of the Lagoon 440 for ourselves? Well, uh, before I do that, I think uh, it's definitely right that customers need, they need to ask better questions. Although some comfort may be important, I, th I think it is good to ask the questions when you go around the catamaran that go beyond the air conditioner. And I will be the first one to look at the electrical installations on a boat, to look at the sails, to look at the blocks and all of that. So, yeah, I must yeah. say, when we went to uh, uh, Cannes in France to yeah. look at the bigger uh, Lagoon catamarans or any other brand catamarans for that matter, um, Anna was uh, straight away under the floorboards checking out the wiring and checking the, the plumbing and, you know, just making sure that electrically our boat would cope because electrics for us on our boat is, is uh, quite something. Um, we sail very differently perhaps uh, to you guys in that we like to carry a lot with us. Uh, we have dive compressors, we have air conditioners, but we are all different and uh, certainly we feel uh, we need air conditioning on our boat. Yeah, and so do a lot of other people, so yeah. it is not it is not something that just pertains to us. When you sail in Southeast Asia, when you have, we have been there over the last year and there were quite a few couples in trouble because there was no air con on the boat and uh, yeah, there wasn't a lot of Fred, hanky Fred, pony, hey Aussie mate. <laughs> <laughs> tough, tough underground worker, used to working in the heat, never needs air conditioning. <laughs> Fred from Pit Pony, I hope you watch this. Um, in fact, uh, his wife Judy, just absolutely lovely couple, uh, Australian couple, sailing with us through um, East Asia on the monohull called Pit Pony. And Judy was like threatening him, if you don't get aircon, mate, uh, I'm out of here. I'm actually going to move on board MP or go and find another dude who has air conditioning on his boat. I'd like to yeah. quote you, Riley, on, on, on the book quote that you made, that life is too short to sail slowly and uncomfortably. And I definitely agree with you. But there is a balance between being fast and also being uncomfortable. So you need to somehow, for whatever is your situation, find a middle way. I think we found that on Impi, but Impi is not a standard lagoon. No, no, it's definitely not the <laughs> lagoon that we bought from the factory. Um, no. And for sure, um, you are quite correct that um, a lot of boats these days, the guys would literally look at an interior design. We know that some of the uh, French uh, boats, for example, outsource their interior design to an Italian company and and you're quite right they literally build the boat around the interior design and um, on MP for example we knew what we were getting into we knew uh, where the problems were with the boat um, we feel that the Lagoon 440 has been a terrific boat uh, for us we've been cruising full-time as you know we bought the boat I think 13, 12 years ago, 13 years 2009, ago? 2009. 2009. So it's 11 years and we have been sailing ever since it's crossed the Atlantic three times. Mm. Pacific, backwards and forwards to Polynesia, to New Caledonia, New Zealand, Australia and Southeast Asia. And then last year or just this year against the weather coming back to Northern Queensland, which is quite an achievement, uh, sailing upwind for two and a half thousand miles. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a 5,000 mile trip and I think half of it was upwind yeah. and uh, coming down the coast of Australia to Cairns was not easy in uh, June month. Uh, very strong currents against us, very strong winds against us. Between Papua New Guinea and Australia we found ourselves in a massive storm. Uh, it was not predicted, so let's just talk about that because you talk about sailing 
uh, from one safe area on the ocean to another safe area on the ocean. And for sure, uh, I do get that uh, with good speeds on your boat, um, that you can maneuver your boat uh, yeah, it's around. It's desirable. Yeah, it's, it's desirable. desirable. You yeah. can maneuver your boat around weather systems to a point. Um, for us, sometimes we actually slow the boat right yeah. down and we let a system go ahead of us. Sometimes and we take all the sails down and we just sit in the middle of a, of a thunderstorm, an electrical storm, and we just let it like squeeze bastards yeah we kind of look at it on radar and try and avoid the the dangerous areas yeah. and and maneuver the boat um, to to get a safe passage through and so far touch wood it's worked very well for us and it's not just um, slowing the boat down because of winds and, and electricity but it's also because of the waves if your waves are spaced four seconds apart you don't really want to go banging through them upwind doing 12 knots you actually want to go slow yeah i think we actually found um something on our boat that we never considered previously but in this horrific storm uh, in excess of 17 knots we actually had to turn the boat around in that storm deploy warps out the back to slow the boat down in the waves um, uh, we were very pleased to be on a heavier boat uh, in those conditions. Um, as I mentioned, um, they were not predicted. Nobody saw them coming. We were looking at weather. Um, our daughter actually called um, the rescue services in New Zealand to say that they have not had word from us in six hours. Yeah, my son uh, called the British Navy. Yeah, and, and both uh, New Zealand and the British Navy were saying they, 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 they are not in a see, storm. They, they didn't, didn't see anything. Yeah. So whatever weather systems the British Navy is using, don't use those. <laughs> anyway, um, the, in Australia, they kind of looked back on the data and they saw how we had actually ended up in a storm. But it had not been predicted at all. And we had a breakthrough from the upper layers and a total bomb, downdraft, they call it a bomb, descend right on top of uh, where MP was and it was just chaos. I mean 70 plus knot winds as I mentioned, huge seas, um, deployed warps out the back, um, found our way around. We were stuck in that system for three days. We could not get out of it. Uh, there was a high ridge extending off the west coast of Australia, another one off the east coast of Australia and this system which had developed off Papua New Guinea just got trapped between the two and, and, and it just wouldn't let us out. Um, so yeah, uh, you, one gets that very seldom of course, and we were at the wrong time of the year in the mm. wrong place, um, that has to do with COVID. In that particular situation, I can honestly tell you, um, we are very happy that we have done the work we've done to MP. We were very happy that we were on a heavier boat as opposed to a light boat. It, we were very happy not to have to be pointing the bows into the wind to reef the mainsail. Mm, I think that is just amazing how we can reef underway. Mm. Whatever point of sail we have, we can just reef down. And yeah, we, we also have like special arrangements with our lines so that one person can do it. Just like you were explaining when we, we just sail the two of us, we never have crew. And we do extensive miles with the 12,000 nautical miles just last year alone. So we we really like it that we can reef all on our own without putting ourselves in danger by pointing the bows into the wind. Uh, we can reef on virtually any point of sail. Uh, it takes a bit of practice, but um, due to the way that our rig is set up, it's, it's very doable and uh, very easy for us to do now that we've got the experience of, of trying it regularly. And I'm the best reefing alarm. Yeah, and it's like a reefing alarm. Mate, I'm trying to keep the sails powerful, but uh, quite correct. You mentioned there that sometimes you can reef <laughs> earlier and get more speed, and uh, I, I just get lazy, and I'm just like, hey, mate, time to reef. <laughs> so I've got a very strong reefing alarm. It, it screams at a high pitch, and uh, there's no missing it, and it keeps going until I actually reef. <laughs> yeah, yeah and another beautiful feature um, on our rig, and something that we look at when we're buying um, a catamaran, ran to the future is that we can sail very close to the wind. Um, in fact we sail closer than a lot of monohulls sail uh, to the wind and there's this whole thing about catamarans not being able to get uh, a close point of sail. 
Um, and what it really comes down to is that on the Lagoon 440, we have uh, two very short spreaders on the mast, and we have a traveler with a Genoa car that sits inbound on the coach roof, not outbound on the side of the boat like, like many catamarans have. And what that does is it allows the Genoa leech to be hauled closer to the center of the boat. And the result of that is that we get very close angles to the wind, which we really love about uh, the Lagoon 440. Um, the disadvantage. That's Brent's party trick. That's my party trick, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the downside is that with wind aft of midship, um, uh, you're letting out too much uh, sheet on your Genoa and you tend to open up the top of the Genoa too soon so you lose a lot of um, power or drive um, and to get around that we rig up a barber hauler on the outboard horns cleat at the midship position and so in effect we have uh, four uh, Genoa sheets uh, attached to the Genoa um, with winds from astern and that tends to keep uh, the sail, the foot of the sail down closer to the boat and it keeps the sail more closed and, and holds uh, the wind better. Yeah, so in terms of performance, because you were talking about that, um, and our lagoon is no longer a standard 440, I would say because the sails have been really developed by a sailmaker here uh, on the Gold Coast, we carry a lot of different sails. Evolution sails. Yeah, yeah evolution guy. sails. Yeah, really, really good. Mm. And so we also have uh, a racing autopilot, the same one as the Utrumair installs. So all of the these H5000. things. The uh, H5000. I think we have two of, computers on there. Yeah. So. All of these things make a lot of difference. We have strengthened the boat structurally, mm. and of course, we got a really good South African skipper. See, <laughs> I've been eating my mealy pup. Only South Africans will understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Having good seamanship, uh, recognizing the waves, and how to position your boat to get maximum performance out of it. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, it depends on one, what, what one is looking for. I mean, um, Kent at Just Catamarans, uh, my cousin, um, is the Outremer dealer, distributor for Outremers through um, the United States. Uh, our son Terry, Terry Grimbeck, is a broker selling uh, Outremer catamarans um, in the United States. He also sells uh, used catamarans. And interestingly enough, he says, you know, Dad, on the second-hand market, um, I have more queries for Lagoon 440 owner versions than almost any other boat. And uh, there's a reason for it. Um, the Lagoon 440 might not be your speedster out there, but uh, we are quite happy. Uh, we average, um, in normal conditions, we average around 180 to 200 miles a day. I think the maximum we have ever done is 240. Yeah, we've done 240 miles yeah. a day, and that's, that's yeah, maximum. That's All things the, were working well. With the big asymmetrics up. Um, we did that two days in a row, yeah. actually, on our Pacific. Okay, so, yeah, we, I know I was just saying, you know, we had the big asymmetric sail up. We sometimes sail with two Genoas out the front, depending on, on the weather. I, I remember um, cruising at good speeds across the Atlantic uh, with just a double Genoa out the front. Mm -hmm. um, we don't like to advertise speeds that our boat achieves. And I think, Riley, you touch on this, and it just shows your good experience, actually, because... Um, you know, so many different factors can determine boat speed or show a boat speed um, on the dial, you know. Um, it could be currents, uh, it, it's, yeah, point of sail, I mean, what's in the boat speed? Are you surfing a wave or not surfing a wave? So I like to just look at sort of daily averages. I'd say a very slow day for us would be 150 miles a day. And, um, of course, um, if we're doing anything under five knots at any time, uh, we would turn a motor on and, and motor sail. Um, but having said that, you know, in all the years of sailing, um, our engines are literally just touching on 3,000 hours. Done a lot of sailing. We've done a lot of sailing. But initially, um, we used the engines also to charge batteries and things like that. When we got going, lithiums were just a no-no. We now have lithiums on board. In fact... Um, when we got going, there was no YouTube sailing video out there. I remember um, 
of the guys starting with their sailing videos. We were just sort of writing blogs back then. Yeah, people were telling us uh, on forums and in writing that there is just no ways that a catamaran, a Lagoon 440, is going to be sailing around the world. There's, there's just no way. And of course, that's all changed now. I wish those people would still be out there to debate this with me, but uh, they seem to have pulled in their horns and, and have sort of disappeared. Um, the big discussion now comes around, ah, oh, the bridge. The bridge is a terrible thing. Um, but once again, you know, people with experience and who sail these boats and, um, you know, they realize that the bridge is actually just an additional feature to the boat. And, um, and sometimes a really good safety feature. A really good safety feature to the yeah. boat, in both, our opinion. Both uh, in coastal sailing where you have reefs, you have really mm. good visibility. And in ocean sailing, you see the waves and you can position the boat accurately as to avoid the, the biggest waves or the breaking waves. Yeah, I find it very difficult not to have my bridge anymore. And this is just how different people are different. And... Um, uh, you know, just with autopilots today, we talk about the H5000, the BNG. Yeah, I've got a few tricks to work out on it still, so maybe I'll chat to you sometime. You've had the uh, BNG H5000 a lot longer than we have, possibly. Um, but with autopilot technology these days, you don't have to be sitting up, you know, at the helm. I mean, you can be relaxed anywhere on the boat for that matter. So, you know, it's just all sort of a learning curve. We've seen people uh, changing their minds about catamarans uh, on, on our travels, people who sail with us, and they're like, wow, you know, we, we're starting to lean towards catamarans. People who were against the bridge had lots of comments, uh, negative comments about the bridge, sailed with us uh, on weekends and things. Wow, we certainly took a boat which we felt was a good base boat to build upon, uh, to make a, a good deep water cruising, a blue water cruising yes. boat. It did not come from the factory like no, that. It was described as a blue water cruising boat in the specs and then we took 18 months after it arrived in Cape Town via Brazil to actually build what we thought was a blue cruising boat and then added on to that in Florida with the help of just catamarans and then definitely transformed the whole electronics and electrical system here in Australia uh, with the help of EV power and obviously also change the sales as we already discussed. Yeah, so um, you know we've built uh, onto the bulkheads. Um, every catamaran has a weakness. Um, every catamaran has a strong point. Um, and it's really important when you buy your catamaran, in my opinion, to just understand uh, what the weak points are, what the strong points are, and up the game on the weak side of it. Um, modifications. And we are still busy with a massive modification now. Yeah, at the moment we're busy building a bulkhead in behind the engine, uh, behind the sail drive and the engine, so that the, boat, the back of the boat uh, is not exposed uh, as much as it was. We, in this last storm, we could see we had the swim ladder, ha ladder uh, hatches that open and close at the back of the boat, and the waves were just pounding up underneath there, ripped off the hatch, um, water coming into the engine room. I'm in a harness and a line overboard uh, with vice grips trying to pull the pins out of what was left of the hatch that was doing more destruction uh, to the fiberglass. Being carefully watched by a bunch of crocodiles on the shore. Yeah, <laughs> apparently in croc water, our Australian mates are telling me. And uh, But anyway, I'm, I've taken a few You're tips. You're more leathery than them. No, I've taken a few tips from Croc Dundee. I'll have a chat to him later about how <laughs> to avoid crocs a little bit better. <laughs> but uh, excuse the footage if it's going grainy. It's getting a bit dark here at the moment. We're on a friend's leopard, by the way, busy chatting to you. Great boat as well. And, um, yeah, so, y you know, uh, we're going to remove that swim ladder step entirely. We're going to close the whole back of the boat off. There will be no more opening hatch at the back of the boat. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be putting a uh, bulkhead in there, looking at what we need to make sure that if we lose a sail drive, because uh, that's a big problem. Uh, Kent was telling me that um, a lot of catamarans have basically sunk uh, to a point um, from losing sail drives, uh, be it fishing cables or whatever that they pick up. 
Mm. So it's a very vulnerable part of the boat, and I'm putting a lot of attention into the engine room at the moment, and mm. what happens if the sail drive gets ripped out or I any of these problems, because I could see on this trip, um, very quickly the engine room could start filling, and fortunately we had uh, these huge roving bilge pumps yeah. on the boat. Anybody out there, you must make sure you have a roving bilge yeah. pump. Absolutely just saved us, um, having roving bilge pumps which we could throw into the engine room, um, big ones. Uh, we have interconnecting swimming pool pipes which float on swimming pools with creepy crawlies and that and so you can interconnect them and throw the pipe out. It, it really proved valuable and in all these years of sailing um, from France to South Africa and across the world um, we've never need, had a need for it but here in this one occasion and it's always these particular once-off occasions that one may get uh, where you want to have all of this uh, all of this gear mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, let's not tell people out there that um, go and buy a Lagoon 440 and mate, you've got a great cruising boat. You actually don't have a great cruising boat. You have a great base uh, boat um, to convert uh, to be a, a solid cruising boat. And I think that's uh, important. Yeah. So, so yeah, to touch on lightweight, uh, yeah, there's advantages, there's disadvantages. Uh, we've seen it with friends with lightweight catamarans. Um, they go fast when the seas aren't big. They have to slow their boats right down because they're lifting off wave tops uh, in strong seas where we're kind of powering through the waves more. Um, advantages and disadvantages and everything. It really depends on what you are looking yeah. for out of your boat. There is one other factor is that we sail in very remote places for yeah. extensive times. And Brent, being a trained diesel mechanic as well as a civil engineer, carries a lot of tools on board. Mm. Uh, every door is full with spare parts. Uh, I don't even have an underwear drawer anymore because you know, it's full with bolts. And no, my tools and actually look very good with your <laughs> underwear. <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that when we were in Indonesia now, we were actually one of the only boats that could affect repairs to to the people who surrounded us. They didn't have spare parts. A lot of lightweight tools. catamarans carrying almost no tools. Yeah. And so we were kind of bunnings on the water. Let's go to MP for tools, uh, yeah. spare parts, yeah. or uh, because we, we we want to know that if we get stuck out there, yeah. uh, we have the tools to get ourselves through. Yeah. Of course, these days, you know, you're looking at newer models of catamarans. Um, people are going electric. Um, people are going uh, common rail engines, uh, which have injectors that are computerized and. Um, uh, they have little EC boards and um, all this sort of things and um, I worry a little bit about lightning strikes, you know, um, and, and the loss of electronic gear on boats and the inability to mm. work your way around it mechanically uh, to get your boat going again or mm. keep it going. Um, yeah. These are new things that I would love to hear your opinion on. Um, because, for example, we were in the Anambas, there, there is absolutely no electronic gear that you can buy. Okay, you're close to Singapore, but in these COVID times you can't actually ship parts in. There are lightning strikes every day. We have side strike. Mm, we win a, a numbers yeah. off season basically. But yeah. yeah. But when you are in an area like that that is remote where you can't fly parts in and then you're electronics get stuffed up that that's a real concern so we want to be very eco-friendly because that's another dimension to which catamaran you would choose and the questions that you need to ask from boat builders but it is actually very hard to be self-sufficient uh, when you have a very eco-friendly boat at the moment and we hope that that improves but with COVID times and the difficulty to get spares it's not there yet Yes, yeah, so I think um, lightweight or lightweight catamaran, just to get back to that, um, mm -hmm. going from point A to point B, I can go faster, I can pick my weather window, I can move my boat around uh, low pressure systems, high pressure systems, wherever you want to be, um, to a point, yes, um, uh, very nice uh, feature and definitely there are times I wish I had more speed on the boat uh, to beat a weather system. Um, we just prepare the boat to ride it out. Um, 
Um, at other times, uh, you find yourself in a bad situation, and I'm actually pleased I'm on a heavier boat. And uh, the heavier boat is, is, is coping well, um, it's not bouncing off the top of waves, it's actually going more through the waves. Um, but most of the time, we are anchored alongside beautiful beaches. Yeah, yeah, we the <laughs> passages are very uh, seldom compared to yes, how long we spend yes. anchored off and islands and things. Yeah. We have the ability to have a lot of people on board. I do a lot of cooking. I have got quite sophisticated cooking stuff on board. And uh, we do a lot of socializing on board. We do. With aircon when it is very hot. We hope to be socializing with you guys soon. Yeah. So most of the time we have got a very comfortable life. We don't need to be in marinas. We do our own mm. washing. As soon as we arrive in a country... We have a full household washing machine on we, board. We are already clean because we made 900 litres of water. I have cleaned the boat. We arrive in the marina for one day and then oof, we're out yeah, we onto the islands. We clear in while a lot of our friends, and they, they will tell you this who sail <laughs> with us, uh, they've run off to do their washing at laundries and get gas and whatever, whatever. We, we're just carrying that much that we can clear in, clear yeah. out and go and enjoy the islands. Yeah. And, and literally, if I, I would love to actually look at how many t days we have spent on passages versus being in destinations this year um, being an exception of running from COVID, but but mm -hmm. generally speaking um y you know we've sailed across the ocean with five x's friends on on Utremer five x's and um i'd be doing 12 knots thinking woohoo you know i mean we're out there and i'd call up johan and say johan how's it going out there and he'd be like hey brent well we're doing 17 to 21 knots so a totally different ball game um you know granted but in all our sailing across the Pacific, um, we were never more than a day late than them at any destination. Somehow it just washed out that if they beat us there by a day, not that we were racing because we don't race our boat, but it, it kind of washed out that way that um, I, I would say a day maximum. Look, Johan um, is also, and Christine, they were both Volvo skippers, Volvo race skippers. Well, they're organizers as well for Volvo yeah. ocean races, yeah. Unlike uh, the two other Utremers we, we sailed to Indonesia with, we arrived a day earlier than them. So, a lot depends on the experience, on picking your we, We're definitely and not so racing though, guys. Honestly. But we were not racing though? Yeah. We've put a screecher we, on the boat, we've got all the, all the sails, we've got, yeah. a, we've got a screecher, two Genoas, um, asymmetric uh, spinnaker, um, and a square top mainsail that's been well designed um, by yeah. uh, Graham and um, it's made a difference to the performance of the boat undoubtedly. It's getting very um, dark here. Huh? Yeah, it's starting to get dark. <laughs> anyway, I think we should wrap this up. It's very nice of you guys to ask us for our opinions. If there's anything else you want to know um, or ask us about um, sailing on production catamarans, uh, not that we want to think of our boat as a production catamaran anymore. Um, we don't want to fool people with that. Uh, please, um, we're in Australia. You're welcome to come chat to us about it, and uh, we'd love to learn more from you guys. We watch your videos. You guys are awesome. Cheers, guys.